Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Increase ROI When Moving Through Exploration into Field Development. I'm Craig Fleming, Technical Editor of World Oil, and will be your moderator today. In this webinar, industry experts will demonstrate the value of using chemical tracers as an essential technology throughout all phases of a reservoir ENP life cycle with a focus on hydraulically stimulated wells. After outlining the different methods of tracer monitoring and guidelines for tracer selection, the webinar will explore the value proposition for using chemical tracer technology during and after exploration through a series of illustrative case histories. The topics of discussion will include guidelines for tracer selection through program design, contrasting the value of using solid or liquid forms, quantifying the impact of diversion strategies and evaluating their effectiveness and true ROI, interference monitoring and parent-child interaction measurements, optimization of fracturing strategies from frac order to landing zone selection, and finally, the value of multidisciplinary data analysis and visualization with a focus on 4D data interpretation. Joining us for today's webcast is Patrick Haynes, Business Development Manager, North America, and Dr. Sudipja Banerjee, Global Technology Manager, both with TracerCo. Uh, before we get started, let's review some general housekeeping notes. Following the presentation, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can participate in the Q&A session during the presentation by typing your question in the Q&A box located on the bottom left corner of your screen and then click the submit button. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the arrows on the top right corner of the slide area. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you're experiencing problems with the program, press F5 on your keyboard to refresh the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the slide window. Now let's get started. Sudipja? Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Sudipto Banerjee. I'm a petroleum engineer, both by education and experience. I've been working in the industry for over 15 years in locations as varied as Alaska to Saudi Arabia. And currently, I am the global technology manager at TracerCo. So I'm responsible for pushing a lot of our R&D in terms of how to develop new types of tracers and, and how to develop new ways of applying tracers. I'm really excited to be talking today. I love these opportunities to try and share knowledge and collaborate with others, establish best practices, uh, which is why in the past I've done all sorts of things along those lines, from teaching short courses in completion design and completion technology to chairing SPE workshops, uh, most recently the SPE Tracer Technology Workshop. And of course, things like the webinar today, which is a great chance to sort of share experiences and knowledge. I'm really excited to be sharing the stage today with my colleague, Patrick Hayes. Now, Patrick has over 17 years just at TracerCo, so the uh, depth and breadth of his understanding of tracers is pretty extensive, which is why he is our North America Business Development Manager today. Uh, in that role, Patrick gets to do what Patrick does best, which is really taking tracer diagnostics and tracer studies and trying to use them with operators to build those efficiencies that come from understanding your reservoir and tying those reservoir characteristics to things like completion design and production processes. Now, before we really get into the, the meat of today's webinar, which is going to be a lot of case studies and how tracers have been applied to gain a better understanding of certain problems, it seemed good that we all start from the same sort of fundamental understanding of what modern tracer studies can do. And to start with that, let's answer the question of what makes a good tracer. Now, a lot of different types of chemicals can serve as a tracer. They can serve as a marker of uh, different in situ reservoir fluids. But not everything that can be used as a tracer necessarily makes for a good tracer. And the distinction is really what sort of uh, draws a line between those experienced tracer companies and, and a good set of technology from companies that are essentially used to just pumping chemicals. Now, we're not going to go into every bullet point that I've listed on this slide today. This is really intended more as a reference for those of you who might review the uh, recording at a later date. And that's because a lot of these bullet points, I think, are pretty intuitive, pretty self-explanatory. 
Uh, for example, I don't think it takes a huge stretch of the imagination to realize that a good tracer is going to be one that's generally non-toxic or has very low toxicity for people to use. Uh, those of you who have experience with tracers before now are probably used to that big shift uh, in the industry from radioactive tracers to, to things that we use today. Radioactive tracers being the precursor for most modern uh, tracer technologies. But we happen to be in an industry that has a, a deficit of good PR, particularly in, in the fields of uh, hydraulically fractured wells. I mean, we're already in a position where the uh, ill-informed and the undereducated view hydraulic fracturing as a net negative, something that is detrimental to the environment, to communities, uh, to life in general. So when you start throwing in loaded terms like radioactive on top of that, well, you, you can understand why we get some degree of pushback. And indeed, when we talk about radioactive tracers, which do have a certain level of toxicity and a certain level of specialized handling to it, um, we're in a position where that extra work in sourcing radioactive material, in training our employees to handle it appropriately, to deal with uh, transportation and disposal, all of these things make radioactive tracers less desirable than a lot of their newer chemical tracer alternatives, which can provide the same sort of data or better, but without those hurdles. Uh, some of the, the bullets on this particular slide that I think are really worth talking about are the ones that really require some degree of work, uh, usually laboratory, and time. And will oftentimes get skimmed over uh, by those less experienced with the value of a tracer study and the things that can go wrong. One of the big ones is the idea that uh, the tracer that you select, a good tracer that you select, should follow a specific phase that you're intending to measure. In uh, a lot of cases, you'll find you know, new companies to, to the, uh, the industry basically pumping any sort of marker. Uh, something that is going to dissolve in water, in oil, in gas, uh, that doesn't really show a lot of distinction between specific phases. And from this, you can get some usable data that really cuts the knees out from underneath an effective tracer study, because you're no longer using tracers as an analog for what you're really interested in, the, uh, the fluid streamlines of oil, the fluid streamlines of gas, of water, as it moves through your reservoir to your, your producer wells or from your injectors. But instead are essentially just measuring the tracer itself, um, which doesn't provide useful information, except as this kind of stand-in for those, those uh, phases that are of interest. Additionally, if you're a company that's used to just pumping chemicals and not necessarily doing a tracer study, you may not do the, the fundamental work to sort of assure that your tracers are going to hold up in a tracer study. You're not going to have that laboratory experience to know that the tracer is not going to degrade at reservoir temperatures or that it might not cause issues of precipitation when it comes in contact with uh, frac fluid chemicals or uh, with your in situ reservoirs themselves. I mean, you don't want to be able to introduce a tracer only to create damage to uh, the existing systems you have in place. I mean, we understand this with, with other fluids. I mean, when you look at uh, completion brines, when you look at, at uh, drilling fluids, even though these seem like very straightforward things, we have this wealth of experience, this wealth of laboratory testing behind it to show that you're not going to have uh, negative side effects or unintended consequences. And when you're looking at a good tracer, you're going to want to be able to do the same things and have that underlying data to prove it. So let's say you've done it. Let's say you have identified a number of chemicals that uh, can develop a tracer portfolio, and uh, they, they meet all these requirements. You know, they're non-toxic. They're an excellent analog and marker of specific phases, oil, gas, water. Um, they're relatively easy to analyze and uh, detect concentrations very quickly using conventional equipment. They're cost-effective. What would that tracer suite now look like? Now, it can take a couple of different forms. We're going to talk about the two most common ones today, starting with what I consider to be the gold standard, really, when we talk about tracers that you might apply to a hydraulically fractured well, namely liquid tracers. Now, liquid tracers are um, added alongside of your frac fluid itself. You basically tie a pipe, uh, not a pipe, a pump, into the back end of your, your frac fluid system. And as you're pumping your slick water, as you're pumping your cross-link gel, uh, you'll be pumping your tracer alongside of it so that 
as your frac fluid goes and breaks your reservoir rock and comes in contact with the situ fluids, your uh, tracers are mixed alongside of it and also come in contact with those fluids. They're, they're mobilized essentially by your frac fluids. And this is a very straightforward concept when we're talking about um, tracers intended to detect water and water movement. Uh, frac fluid systems tend to be aqueous in nature. Whether you're talking about a slick water or cross link gel, you're going to be 90, 95, 98% water. Uh, and many companies have very effectively applied water tracers, liquid water tracers to, to frac uh, fluid systems. Where it really gets clever is when we start talking about oil tracers. So an effective oil tracer, like I said before, is going to want to really move only with your in situ reservoir oil. You're not going to generally want it to be displaceable by in situ water or by water you've introduced from your, flat, uh, your frac fluid system. So how do we get an oil tracer to get pumped alongside an aqueous frac fluid and not have problems with flowback or not have problems with it not being mobilized at all because it doesn't want to uh, mix with an, an aqueous system? And it's a very clever problem and has a very clever solution. Namely, the solution tends to be uh, these breakable emulsions. So if I have a, uh, a liquid oil tracer that I want to introduce to a frac fluid, I will create an emulsion that will allow it to have some degree of uh, mobilization by an aqueous system. So in a system that lacks any hydrocarbons at all, this emulsified form of my liquid oil tracer will generally take um, some degree of <laughs> degree of mobilization and will kind of spread across the surface of oh. my, my frac fluid. Now, as I start breaking my reservoir rock, as I start creating my fissures, my fractures, as my, my fluid starts moving into the reservoir, what happens? I come in contact with my in situ fluids. You know, I'm going to come in contact with in situ water, but most importantly, I will be coming in contact with in situ hydrocarbons. And as soon as your frac fluid and your tracer comes in contact with the oil that exists in your reservoir, that emulsion degrades and the non-emulsified form of your oil tracer now does what it wants to do. It wants to exist in an oil phase. So it essentially jumps phases. It jumps out of your frac fluid system into the oil that's come in contact with. Once your, your tracer is in your oil, it does what tracers are intended to do, liquid tracers at least. Uh, it proceeds to mix and disperse and start spreading through all the interconnected oil that is regionally close by. Um, the analogy would be that of adding food coloring to a glass of water. You know, as you add drops, even if you don't stir it up, naturally you'll see that that uh, uh, droplet of food dye start to disperse below until everything has a very light coloring to it from the dye itself. This ability to design a, a breakable emulsion and one that um, is mobilized by your frac oil, but stops being mobilized by your frac oil is really the key and the reason why oil tracers tend to be best in liquid form. Because in doing so, I can mobilize my oil, uh, my oil tracers, and place it amongst my oil and be assured that when I go to production or I have any sort of flowback of my frac fluid system during cleanup and the like, none of that tracer is going to come back. Because as long as you come in contact with oil, as long as you have some degree of contact with hydrocarbon, my oil tracer is now going to be fixed in my reservoir only in interconnected oil and no longer can be mobilized by in situ water or by my, my frac fluid systems. It's a very clever idea. And it allows us to do something that's critically important, which is apply a fixed known amount of tracer to all of my in situ oil or all my in situ water or all of my in situ gas at once. <clears throat> this is critically important because when we start wanting to, to take our tracers and use them as these measures of oil movement and water movement and gas movement, Applying it all at once and being able to effectively do a mass balance is the key to being able to quantify how our, our fluids are moving in the reservoir and where they're coming into our well bore. Now, the data that you get from um, a, 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 a study, a frac uh, study using tracers, seems relatively simple. Uh, if you were to look at it, what you'd see is that after applying a unique tracer, 
ideally to every zone or to some combinations of zones of interest. Um, you have a certain amount of time where that, that tracer is not allowed to disperse in the phases it's trying to mark, and then you start collecting samples when you go to production. And, you know, every couple of hours, you know, a couple of times a day, we're going to catch samples of the produced oil and gas and water. And we're going to start looking to see which of our injected tracers for that phase are present and at what concentration. And uh, we'll also be looking at a tally of just how much total oil, total water, total gas has been produced. Now, this seems like a really straightforward, very simple sort of data set, right? Uh, concentration, total production. How do we go from that um, to very complicated understandings of our reservoir? And the answer goes into that mass balance and how these data interplay with each other. So <clears throat> with our daily tracer production and our daily um, uh, production from the well, we have some information about which traces are being produced and what concentration. And we can use those mass balance equations now to start drawing certain conclusions. We can start saying, okay, for these results to be possible and meet the requirements of, of a physical system, a closed physical system, we have to be seeing these sorts of streamlines, these sorts of productions from our different zones. And now we can start having uh, not only an understanding of cumulative production per zone, like you might see in this graph with, with the blue bars, but you can start talking about the trends over time as your system kind of falls into a steady state uh, sort of production. You know, is this a zone that, that cleaned up right away, that came on right away online? Has this been giving you a very constant sort of production or is it something that initially was overshadowed and came back? Uh, you can get a lot of uh, very complicated conclusions from a very simple data set when you can quantify your data. Beyond that, you can start looking at how these uh, tracers have moved within your local sort of reservoir space. If you start seeing these, these tracers being produced at uh, the well that you zipper fract with or other wells on a pad or even other wells in a particular reservoir layer, we can now start making certain conclusions that are built around uh, the mathematics of, of mass, conservation of mass to start talking about, um, <clears throat> say, um, uh, stress shadow fields, about uh, interconnected uh, fracks and frac hits, and whether or not they close over time. Um, in more complicated studies, this can actually give us some very detailed information about how enhanced oil recovery is working for us, the effectiveness of, of water floods and CO2 floods and things like that. Uh, it can become a very complicated analysis using tracers as a stand-in because we can measure tracers and talk about where the tracers are moving in a way that we can't with the in-situ oil watering us. This is why I absolutely love uh, liquid oil. Common sort of technology that you'll see in tracer studies in hydraulically fractured well is that of solid particulate tracers. Now, this takes um, a good set of tracers, but applies it to the well in a very different manner. So instead, we're using a carrier particle. So we're going to use something that uh, is very good at absorbing our, our trace. So you can think of things like um, activated charcoal or, or zeolite, things that you've used in probably other uh, aspects of your life to absorb chemicals. And instead of absorbing things like, you know, lead and mercury and poor flavors from your water and your water pitcher, you're now using those same materials to absorb an oil tracer, to absorb a water tracer and the like. Then we can use this particulate matter and pump it alongside our propent so that the carrier molecules become embedded in our propent bed. Now, this is a really inexpensive and really clever way of getting a qualitative understanding of when particular phases are flowing to your well and where they're flowing from. The reason why I say qualitative is because when we start talking about trying to quantify the results, the mass balance equation becomes very questionable. With liquid tracers, we apply all our tracers pretty much immediately to the phase that we're trying to measure. With particulate tracers, the tracer is being released under specific conditions. So that particular particle has to be in contact with the phase that it intends to mark. Um, 
and then it releases its tracer. But how much tracer it releases is going to be dependent on how much tracer it has absorbed, on how much surface area it has, on how much of that surface area is actually in contact with the phase that you intend to mark, on things like uh, temperature, all sorts of variables that you can't effectively control uh, in a real world situation. I mean, surface area alone throws the ability to do a mass balance out the window because just like regular propent, you have issues with embedment, with, with crushing, with um, distribution of, of different bits of your propent, the pump particles, uh, depending on size um, within your, your propent bed itself. Um, <clears throat> all of these things basically make you very uncertain about how much tracer is actually in your system to be produced. So while it gives you some assurance that, you know, yes, this tracer in this zone is coming in contact with the given phase, so that phase has to be flowing, to be able to say for certain that this zone is producing more than the zone next to it, for example, gets very shaky. Uh, that particular question gets gets even more complicated when you think about the fact that um, solid particulate tracers tend to be a very low cost solution. So not a whole lot tends to be used. Uh, the norm really is to be able to use less than 10 pounds of these, these particulate carrier molecules in a given fract uh, stage. So let's say I'm in the, the scoop stack, you know, here, here in North America. You know, a, a normal stage might pump 380,000 pounds of profit. If only 10 pounds of my particulate tracer is being added to it, that's the equivalent of 0.02% of my profit pack. Uh, here, here's kind of like a visualization to help you understand that. You know, I have 100,000 dots in this image. 0 0.02 means two of these dots are red. If I ask you to say which of these two dots are red without zooming in, you probably have no idea. And this becomes a potential problem because if you have, say, phase slippage, if you start seeing your oil and water kind of forming distinct layers within your, your fracture, um, if you have your propent kind of going to a, a secondary fracture or fissure that closes off and becomes non creatory you can be in a position where um, your, your injected tracer may never actually even come in contact with what you intend to trace. Um, yes, you don't have to worry about flow back because it's stuck in the problem bed, but you don't know where in the problem bed, you don't know if it's a, a contributory part, it becomes better for qualitative assessments. Because while statistically you're still very likely to come in contact with what you want to trace, it's not a guarantee. So this is really a sort of technology that's great for when there are big gaps in your, your knowledge base. Like if you're only trying to do toe, middle, and heel of a well, and you're not really trying to get a full understanding of what your reservoir is doing. Uh, if you're only trying to get um, flow assurance from like the toe, uh, basically when you're going for like a very simple low science approach where a qualitative understanding is enough, that's where this sort of technology really shines. So with that understanding of your most common types of tracers to be applied to a stimulated well, Let's talk about how we might actually go about designing a project to make use of those strengths and weaknesses of the different technology types. How we might go about actually planning uh, a tracer study for an unconventional well. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my partner, Patrick Hayes, as he actually starts talking about study design and uh, particular case studies where tracers have answered some very important questions. Sidipja, thanks for that introduction and uh, the chemical tracers overview. We'll start with a little segment on project design and planning before we move into the case studies. Project design is an important part and there are several items that need to be taken into consideration to make a successful project and acquire the desired results. Unconventional tracer studies may be less straightforward than you might expect. Project conditions will determine many factors when creating the right project design. First, the different phases to be traced must be identified to accomplish the goals and objectives. Not tracing a phase may influence the success or leave questions. Often one primary phase may not be enough to complete the project goals and objectives. A combination of phase behaviors can be used, such as tracing not only the primary hydrocarbon phase, but also understanding reservoir fluid production, locations, and completion fluid responses. 
the mass of the tracer used needs to be calculated to meet the project timing and can be considered when determining the most efficient application. Additional dilution volumes need to be considered as they can shorten the life of a tracer study. Chemical tracers do not have a half-life like radioisotopes, but will be influenced by the amounts of dilution from the phase's production. In addition to these items mentioned, we also need to consider what other data sets are available that might help with nailing down conclusions. 4D models can greatly assist in visualization, visualizing the impacts of multi multivariables. Combining quantifiable phase production data from liquid chemical tracers with other known completions, reservoir, and geologic data sets will significantly add to the project's outcome. With any project using quantifiable production data, the production cumulative and the production trend over time must be looked at both separately and together to come to conclusions, as Sadipja mentioned earlier. This can be difficult when looking at multiple wells, different stage locations, and changes along the well bores at the same time. It's important to have a tool that can be used to slice and dice the data and review what's happening from different angles. Having a way to easily filter the data, selecting specific items along well bores is needed to analyze the different variables that are associated. The combination of raw data, filters, and 4D viewers greatly assist in drawing the needed conclusions to uncover the results and make decisions on how to move forward. Let's move on to the first case study. The first case study uses water and gas phase tracers to investigate the impacts on production from decisions to change the drilling targets. We start at the top of the slide looking at different ge geology intervals that were identified and drawn along the lateral. As seen in the representation, the well was intended to be landed and drilled along the initial target location presented as the red trace. After drilling approximately a third of the lateral, the operator made the decision to go to a lower target that would be faster and easier to drill. The lower brown trace represents the intended lower target. Significant changes in gamma ray profile can be seen once the well fell below this second target and became much more higher and deviated. Understanding the decision to move the well bore and how it related to production was of significant interest and the return on investment would come from knowing the impacts on gas and water production of the wellbore locations above and below the initial target zones. There's a lot of information in this slide, and I'll start by describing the different components. The slide presents the gamma ray profile as a heat map along the lateral for easy interpretation. The well bore was completed with 26 stages of similar design and volumes. The stage locations are numbered below the well. As seen by the heat map, the toe stages 3, 4, and 5 move back into similar gamma ray rock response as the heel of the well. Stage 7 is located at the facies change or faults where the well direction and angle was being adjusted to stay in the desired location. The red bar graphs represent the top 10 gas producing stages along the lateral. As indicated, many of the best producing stages are located at the heel of the well in the initial drilling target location except for stage seven. However, initial uh, cumulative recoveries do not consider changes in production over time. 
production over time should be part of any evaluation process. I mentioned that both the water and gas were traced in this well. Slide 23 presents the top 10 combination of reservoir fluids and completion fluid volumes recovered by stage. Eight of the 10 highest water contributors were located after drilling changes were made and focused in the direction of the lower target. As water production was a concern for this project, the water data provided insight into unloading of the well post-fracturing, as well as understanding the water production could re be reduced without a negative impact on the gas production in the future. Over the last few slides, we've reviewed a lot of cumulative data and mentioned the evaluation of production over time. So far, we haven't shown the difference in the two measurements and the impacts. This slide presents the initial week's production using the dark red bars as the cumulative and the lighter pink bars as the last day's gas production allocation when the sample was collected. With this, we see the heel dominant initial cumulative production. But did this continue as the rest of the lateral cleaned up? The later cumulative production shows, uh, shown tells us more about the, the long-term expectations of the well. Once again, the dark red bars indicate the cumulative production and the pink bars, the gas production along the allocation from the last sample collected. For reference, I have included the top 10 cumulative producing stage images from, er from the earlier slide in the bottom right of the picture. One major difference is that stages three, four, and five located in similar rock property as the heel do not show up in the cumulative top 10. However, looking at the last sample samples gas production rates per stage, they are equal to or greater than those in the heel stages. This further signifies the importance of being near the initial target location and not drilling below. Tracing technology is being used for the next generation of development not just looking at infield spacing, but many other applications from frac order to helping with development of best practices for parent wells. With mature wells included in assets, understanding what can be done to improve their production, as well as how to start with the infield development to maximize recovery and minimize costs. The study was done, <clears throat> case study three begins to light two primary goals. One was the exploration of a new potential landing window to increase the field's potential and how to deal with nearby parent wells and protect them from negative uh, effects of communication. This study was done in the Mississippian, located in Oklahoma. There are multiple transitions and thickness changes in the formation, depending on your location. This creates a four-dimensional problem that can leave many scratching their heads and wondering what has caused the production differences between wells. The operator identified a potential layer that may be more productive more favorable for drilling and would benefit completions. The production from the standard location of drilling and completions is identified in the blue bar labeled the E target zone. The new location of drilling and completions is labeled the, to the right as the ED interface. 
as seen by the respective blue bars of production, the ED interface significantly outperformed the initial E target zone. The second part of the study was to evaluate child parent interferences and to evaluate the benefit of mitigating strategies. The two well pads used in the study are identified in the well diagrams below. Both pads are designed with two child wells landed below the parent with similar distances between wells and horizons and completions. So as a baseline, the first three well pad, one parent well and two child wells was completed using no mitigating factors to reduce communication with the child wells and the one parent well. The parent well was shut in during completions of the child wells and the amounts of communications monitored over time. The results indicated there were, was more than 17% communication from the child well, one nearest the parent and the parent well. In the following pad, now presented on the screen, the parent well was loaded with a predetermined amount of fluid. The child wells were drilled and landed in similar dimensions as the previous pad and the same completions volumes applied. In conclusion, the amounts of communication were reduced more than 51%. Case study three, completions order, and their effects play a large role in, perform in well performance and the communication on pads, more so than you might think. The next case study will be brief, but shows how frac height can change quickly and can be mitigated making changes and using the frac order to reduce communications. There are fair, num there are fair numbers of variables that can affect the reasons to choose the best order of completions. The maximum stress orientation, the location of your available acreage, future development, existing wells in the area, known barriers or the lack thereof, and fluid systems being used to minimize outward growth and contain a nearer to the wellbore completions. These are all examples of possible influences, though there are many more. The wells on, on the slides were landed in different producing formations. Starting from the top, the middle sprayberry, the middle well in the lower sprayberry, and the bottom well in the Wolf Camp A. To make the presentation flow a little easier and the description of events easier to understand, I have labeled the wells one, two, and three starting from the top. The bubbles along the lateral are from the oil tracers applied to well one during the stimulation of the well one and produced from the three wells. As indicated, there was shared communication of hydrocarbons across all three wells. We have to ask how did this happen? Stage one, two, and three of the Wolf Camp A well, numbered three at the bottom, were completed first. Without any significant barriers or pressure to reduce the fracture height, the fracture grew upward and intersected the two wells above, creating a shared communication path for all three laterals. So when looking further down the lateral, minimum com communication is observed with the subsequent stages following the first three stages of well one. What changed? After pressure was observed 
by well one during the stimulation of the first three stages of well three at the bottom, the zipper frack order was changed to completing several stages of wells one and two to get ahead of three before including three in the zipper operations, providing pressure above to limit the amount of upward frack growth. This slide presents the production from the injected wells and the communication of the other two offset wells on the pad. By changing the completions order, the amount of communication and upward frat growth was greatly reduced. With the final case study, we will discuss the use of different fluid systems and the effects of one system used in the Permian Basin. The goals and objectives of the project were to see if the use of a chemical diverter applied during stimulation could possibly reduce the amount of fracture length, reduce communication with offsets, and make for more com complex fractures nearer to the well bore. To meet these goals, <clears throat> to meet these goals would require both the monitoring of oil and water phases, the evaluation of the interactions between all 10 wells would be needed to analyze and understand the completion's effectiveness. Four of the 10 wells sam sampled were traced for the purposes of the study. The other four wells were also traced for tow flow confirmation purposes and as controls. Each of the four trial wells had a series of stages that were completed with diverter and without diverter. Each group was traced with a unique tracer based on completions type. The amounts of water and oil recovered from the inner interactions would be summed between the injected wells and that recovered of offsets for the stages with diverter and without diverter for comparison. The cube to the right of the screen sets the scene for the locations of the wells. The formation bench location is identified in the lateral colors of the cube. The hash white boxes provide the pairs of wells zippered together with the number identifying the order of their completions. In total, there were eight wells newly completed on the pads with two existing parent wells also sampled identified in green. There are several things to consider in these tests that are not related to the diverter or non-diverter completion fluid systems influence and the fluid influence of the fractures. Frac order influences initial communication of frac fluid and fracture direction as presented in one of the prior case studies. Order of production can influence initial fluid migration and quantitative evaluations over time are quite critical. The plot provides the gun barrel view of the wells associated with the project. The frac order for these wells is identified by the number of the wells within the circle. And the purple numbers present the order of opening the wells to, to production. There's a lot going on in this slide, and I'll do my best to describe it all. The chart presents the data from well one, located in the middle sprayberry, and the cumulative communication data. We will start with the pie charts located at the top. Each of the pie charts presents the cumulative oil or water production recoveries from the injected well in dark green and the offsets in yellow. Each
phase of water and oil have a pie chart for the stages completed with diverter and non-diverter stages. On the top left, the pie chart presents the cumulative water traced without diverter recovered from the injected well at 24% versus the percentage from the offsets sampled at 76%. The second pie chart on the top left, we have the same data for stages with diverters applied for the injected well at 30% tracer recovered and the offset cumulative recoveries at 70%. The pie chart to the right presents the same information for non-diverter stages and those diverter stages, but presents oil recoveries. For well one, 94% of the oil tracer tracers were recovered by the non-diverter group stages from the injected well, with 6% produced from offsets. In comparison to the stages completed with diverter, had just 80% of the oil recovered from the injected well and 20% from the offsets. This analysis was completed for each of the four wells and will be presented in bar graphs in the next slide. In addition, the direction of communication was evaluated and plotted for visualization for each of the wells. The direction of fracture growth and communication was greatly influenced by the presence of the parent wells to the left. With a second primary influence from the completion order, using mass balance equations for the tracer recoveries, both the oil and water phases was necessary to understand the effectiveness. The bar graphs have two colors per well traced. With the cumulative water data in blue and the green for the oil, the darker of the two colors per bar present the cumulative recoveries for the injected well and the offset wells in the lighter color. You can tell there are 12 bars in bars and graphs for the four wells that were treated with diverter completions and non-diverter completions. This is both for oil and water tracers. In each trace traced Two graphs of non-diverter completion stages were traced and one group for diverter stages. So reading the bar graphs from left to right, the two left pairs, paired sets of bars are non-diverter stages with the third pair providing the group diverter stages recoveries for that one particular well. We begin from left with the first two pairs of blue bars that had no diverter applied. The third pair from the left presents the stages with diverter applied to that well. As seen, the stages with diverter had more produced from the offset wells, shown in light blue, than the traced well, shown in dark blue and even greater than those two groups of stages to the left that had no diverter applied. Directly below in green presents the oil cumulative production of the stages completed without diverter and diverter as cumulative production from the injected well and offsets, similar to what we described above. Both non-diverter and diverter stages provided similar ratios of recoveries from the injected well and offset wells. This did not happen in all test wells, but no significant improvement was observed that was consistent across both phases traced as, conclu as a conclusion from the test the well's location, proximity to offset parent wells, and frac order 
was more influential than the use of diverters during the completions. Significant differences were observed in the communication and individual wells production of frac fluids versus oil production trends indicating the need to use both phases to evaluate this performance. With that, I'll hand it over for questions. Thanks, Patrick, and Sudipta for that excellent presentation. We'll now transition to the Q&A portion of our webcast. I want to encourage the audience to think about what you've just heard and seen and get your question in uh, regarding these case studies so our technical experts can get you an answer. Uh, with that, we'll take uh, our first question. Uh, what's the difference between completion tracers and tracers injected with profit? I could take that one if you like, Sudipta. I'm not sure if you're muted there, Sudip Sudipta. I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, go ahead, Ben. Yes, if you'd like to take it, you can. All right. You bet. Uh, completions tracers. Well, if a uh, if during the operations the completions fluids are traced with a fixed concentration of tracer use, utilizing a liquid, right? You end up with a direct correlation between the amount of mass tracer recovery and the amount of fluids that were used, and a correlation from what zones uh, the amount of reservoir fluids are being produced, right? When utilizing a solid tracer, a profit tracer, to trace the completions fluids, one of the major drawbacks is that you lose all quantifiable aspects. Solid materials, as Sadib to describe, have too many compli complicating factors to provide any kind of, so of quantitative measurement under, under a steady state condition. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Patrick. Great answer. Next question. Has this tracer technology been performed in deep water fields with commingled production systems? I'm going to grab that one as well, just because I'm familiar with it, if that's okay, Sadipja. Um, there, there's been quite a few deep water applications um, in particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, even on some wells that have fairly high temperatures. Uh, the combination of the use of both inflow tracers and stimulation tracers can provide significant benefits. Um, if you're in a situation where you have to use just one or the other, um, they provide their specific uh, information, but when combined together, the inflow tracers and frac fluid tracers, uh, you can get some enormous amounts of data, both in the short term and long term. So we have experience doing it. Um, a lot of times there's opportunities to use both, depending on what completions is being done, right? That, that is a factor that will determine which one's going to be best and if there's an opportunity to, to use both. So they are being used in deep water applications um, to provide some different influ uh, different data sets. And to expand on that, I can, uh, I can email, email that, that information, but uh, they both have different, different benefits. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, here's another question. Have chemical tracers been validated by other diagnostic tools or methods? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so the obvious thing that you could compare tracers to, of course, is a, a PLT, a production logging tool, which is a tool that you could run to try and engage kind of the, the relative contribution of different zones along your lateral. And nearly, well, I wouldn't say nearly every, but there have been quite a few papers um, by TracerCo, by other tracing companies trying to compare the two technologies. And uh, you tend to see very high levels of agreement. 
um, and then operators generally go into why they prefer one technology over the other. Tracers have the advantage of being longer term, lower cost usually, not requiring your, your well to be shut in, things like that. But uh, tracer technology has also been, been validated uh, by operators in a, a number of different ways. Um, <clears throat> We've seen a lot of times tracer diagnostic information kind of being overlaid or being used as, as a complementary source of information to other diagnostic tools. So uh, let's say you're looking at microseismic data. Microseismic's a great tool for indicating where your rock has broken, but not necessarily for indicating that those, those fractures are actually connected. Um, but if you take your microseismic data and you take your tracer data and you kind of overlap the two sorts of maps that you might get from the, the two respective diagnostic types, that'll give you much more insight because now you have an idea not only where rock has broken, but uh, where you're actually seeing contributory fluid flow, uh, fluid movement um, kind of overlapping it. Uh, you've seen validation by things like distributed temperature sensing, um, uh, all sorts of different tools and, and well tests have kind of proven out the idea that tracers are this very low cost and fairly accurate way of gauging um, contributory production and interwell communication uh, along a well bore. Excellent, thank you, Stipcha. Here's another question. How many individual tracers are required and do we need to trace both oil and water? Well, that depends on what you're trying to, to determine. Um, for example, if all you're really trying to do is something simple, like determine tow flow or uh, see if a packer is actually holding and preventing fluid flow, you don't need very many tracers. But the more tracers you use, the more granularity, uh, the more information you can now pull from your reservoir. Um, and when you want to really understand that interconnection of your reservoir characteristics with your completion choices and your production choices, you are probably going to want to trace both oil and water in every single uh, fracked stage. The, the, the value of tracing both phases is that both phases don't necessarily behave the same. Uh, you, uh, I see, are uh, in academia. You're at UT Austin. Um, I'm sure in your studies, you've come across the fact that the relative mobility of oil and water in a reservoir can, can vary wildly. Uh, and so the way water behaves when you have overlapping drainage areas or, or uh, faults or fracks may not necessarily be the same way that oil behaves. And so by really breaking down your information so that you can see different zones and different phases and how they are interconnected and that sort of contrasting against each other. This is what's really going to give you the most information. And it's particularly useful when you want to start doing things like validating numerical simulations, because seeing the actual streamlines for water and oil versus just fluid or just one or the other, um, considerably more useful. Uh, so uh, I hate to say it depends. It's a very common answer in petroleum engineering, but uh, it depends on the goals of your of, of your tracer study. For a true high science project, for a true understanding, I would recommend getting as much granularity as possible and to trace as many phases as possible. Yeah, I can add to that, Sadipta. There's the the economic side of things. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be economic constraints in any project, and you have to see where your primary goals and objectives are. Uh, how many different things or variables you're you're dealing with the more var variables you have more than likely the more uh phases you'll need to trace to understand how completions fluids are interacting with those rock properties uh, the more granularity you're gonna want right uh, but there's a lot of different complementary things that can be utilized in evaluations um, that'll benefit the outcome of your project. But definitely, as Sadipja mentioned, granularity, the more granularity you have, the better. Perfect, here's another one. If I use tracers for exploration wells with DSTs, say I have a pay zone of 100 meters would I be able to use tracers to understand what part of the pay zone is contributive, contributing quantitatively, qualitatively? Uh, 
Again, it depends. Um, that, that does make things a little bit more challenging because you're not uh, really kind of hydraulically isolating different different parts of your, your, your pay zone. Um, but there are workarounds that would allow you to do that. Um, gosh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this. We'll try. Uh, <laughs> very recently, for example, we were actually playing with this, a, a similar sort of concept um, where a operator looked to try and stimulate the entire uh, lateral at once, but still wanted to use tracers to try and apply um, it very localized sites. There are certain workarounds um, where the traces were built into the completion and had particular release triggers so that you could, in fact, localize what zones or, or sort of subzones were being treated with tracers, um, even though you were pushing fluids into a, a sort of commingled space. So um, it's possible, it complicates things a lot, and so it's harder to give a, a one-size-fits-all answer. But um, there's an engineering solution to, to most hurdles. Perfect. Sounds good. That's all we're going to have time for today. We'd like to thank you all for attending today's webcast. We'd also like to thank Tracer Co. for putting together this timely and informative presentation. Finally, an on-demand version of the webcast will be made available in the coming days and will be emailed to everyone. This concludes our presentation.